pleasure for me to be here again at the microfinance conference. Microfinance is something that hopefully we believe is going to change the poverty line of Pakistan. Pakistan, as you know, suffers from huge financial exclusion. The total number of active borrowers in a country of 220% increase in active borrowers per annum. We are still only at 7.5 million. And our while our ambition is to get to 10 million in 2020, I believe as an industry, our ambition ought to be in the next five years to grow another 10 million, so double the amount that we actually increased years. In order to do that, we have to rethink how we are EMI loan. We continue as far as our customer journey is concerned, seven days to book a customer. We continue to have cost, which subsequently translate into potentially high. So let's start. I'm going to talk about three main points, and I'm going to talk for 10 minutes because the Honorable Minister has a very tight schedule, and we've already eaten into half an hour of his time by inviting him late because my friends in the audience arrived late. Anyway. We, how do we onboard a customer right now? Most of us still use paper and filling in the application by hand, which then is get moves from the branch manager to the credit committee, leading to between three and seven days. There's only two to three microfinance institutions that I'm aware of, which have started use it, using electronic onboarding. What is stopping us from having a tablet that acquires the entire customer information within a 10 or 15 minute period, does an ECB IV check and a NADRA check right there on the spot. And most of us are more than a year old, which means that we should now have algorithms and scores how to say in principle yes or no to a customer with as soon as that application is done. The verification process, if you have one, can follow suit. So the first thing we need to look from the customer lens is rather than three to seven days in this period of technology and given that most of us are more than five years old as institutions, why aren't we giving an in principle approval within 15 to 20 minutes from taking the customer application? This technology exists, it's just your resolve to look at the customer journey and change the customer UI UX from where it is right now. So that's the first thing, embrace technology. What is stopping you to get, if you're a non-bank, a private label wallet so that the customer money, instead of being given in cash or through a banking account, is pushed into a wallet, which is your private label wallet, and all that activity that takes in the wallet, then subsequently, you are privy to, which further allows you to improve your credit understanding of the customer. This technology exists. Why are we not embracing it? Because what will this will do is, the first point that I'm making is change the customer journey from seven days to 10 to 15 minutes and including the verification at best to one day. Then you're really helping the bottom of the pyramid. Push the money into a wallet, monitor the transaction activity, create credit scores so that you can either increase your customer limits faster, have a lower default rate, although the default rate of the industry is not that high, but overall that will allow you to reduce your cost of operations. Just the fact that you're going to initially have capital expenditure, but you'll automate your underwriting and your onboarding can have 3 to 5 percent reduction in your operating cost because the holding of each relationship manager can substantially increase. First point. Second point is the products. Why are we still wedded to a 12-month EMI? Why are we only doing crop-based bullet loans? What about the intra-month requirement of microfinance customers? What about the liquidity they require when they run out of money during the month itself? Remember that Pakistan has one of the lowest number of people with a credit score. If you look at the total data points in all our credit bureaus for retail, maybe 10 to 15 million data points. 
there is nothing stopping you to provide 2000 to 3000 rupees within the month to your customer to basically start establishing a credit history and then because you are a microfinance bank or a MFI you can graduate them to your normal microfinance higher number of higher loan amount the challenge i know for most banks is going to be productive versus consumption loan and that's something we want to work on the customer so we need to have both liquidity intervention as well as productive intervention this will enable us to onboard lot more customers and part of which who can graduate to your normal microfinance bank if you don't have the technology the technology available in the market you can partner with people so that's one product you need to look at intra month liquidity just a one month loan small starter loan to establish a credit score for your customer base the second piece that we need to look at is the s of the sme some of us some of your participants have started looking at that this is the biggest missing middle in pakistan microfinance average rates are still only about 70000 they've increased if i adjust them for inflation actually they've decreased the average borrowing rate level that we have in Pakistan for the last five years. If you look at institutions who are doing S of the SME, very few, whether we've got now a limit of 10 lakhs, but the average over there still is one to three lakhs. Why can't we look at that segment using technology, partner with people who can onboard them on your behalf, create a private label wallet, have it used at the merchant, so then you have more data points to lend to these people. From the government side, the state bank has just come up with a regulation where onboarding micro and small merchants has become much, much easier than it was before where we are requiring memorandum and article of associations from people who don't know what these documents are. But the new, docu the new onboarding mechanism is very positive. There's minor changes requiring that which the industry is working with the central bank to help populate. One of the key concerns of this segment remains the tax net. If I come to your instrument, then I will come to my tax net and then FBI will come to me back. So we are speaking with the FBI as an industry that this segment, for the cash side, just give them a tax break. Tax them for the digital side which we track. And after three years, tax them for everything. This is something that the FBI has responded positively on that if we can bring a million new taxpayers into the net, that the million new taxpayers, not all of them will be taking taxes in day one, but the culture of reporting their taxes, having you know, either a POS machine or a QR code or tap and pay device, we as the microfront industry can lead it. You are the people who have branches in those areas where commercial banks do not. You can lead this effort. You can work with partners who can provide the machines. It's not your capital that's required. So that's the second point I challenge the industry to think about. And the Pakistan Microfinance Industry you know, Network will do what it can in terms of research to assist you. The third big topic that I want to talk about is customer access or right to data. Commercial banks are sitting on reams of data and operational account of their customers. Telcos are sitting on reams of data for feature phone account holders with them. Utility companies are sitting on tons of data against customers. In Europe, they've done something formal, but in our neighboring countries, there's something less formal, where they've created a framework whereby customers have a right to their data to be provided to third parties of their choice. This data is co-owned by both the provider and the customer. And we need to come up with a framework with the central bank, with PTA, with the government's help, whereby any customer whose data is lying in a commercial bank, in a telco, in a utility company, should be able to provide that data to a third party, whether it's a fintech or other provider, which will enable them to use that to make an intervention. We are data rich, cash poor. And this is one way, by the use of data, again, you can have fair underwriting which allow you to lend to these people because without these data points, it's very difficult to do so. Ladies and gentlemen, the microfinance industry can lead this financial exclusion or financial inclusion initiative that the government wants, the central bank wants, but you can lead it 
we should not look towards commercial banks or other entities to actually help us in this. We can be the catalyst. And I'm going to end on a share, which I normally do, and it's targeted towards us and the big boys of the industry. And the share is that we are sorry. Oh, okay, we have to go back to this. We are all the same as 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 the same would request her Honorable Chief Guest, Mr. Abdul Hafiz Sheikh, Special Advisor to the Prime Minister of Finance and Revenue, to please come and share their opening remarks. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Nasim Hussain Sahab, uh, distinguished guests, dear participants, Assalamu alaikum and good morning. I want to appreciate the speech uh, and the good work that Nadim is doing. He's dressed like he's just come from Naples or something, and he's speaking like a, you know, inspirational poet. So it's a good combination. Um, let me say I'm honored to be here in this uh, gathering, which is uh, addressing a very important topic. And I'm really hopeful that we will come out with this conference with some good practical ideas. Um, I want to also start by uh, congratulating the Pakistan Microfinance Network, as well as all the people who participated in it, financed it, and supported it. So let's give a big hand to all the organizers. I think a lot of good progress has been made in this field. Uh, I know I was told there is 7 million plus borrowers that uh, saving outreach uh, covers about 30 million accounts, that there are 9 million insurance policy holders, that it's uh, the sector is promoting jobs and economic activity and welfare. And and not uh, often done a good job in overcoming. So if you see where are the areas that this microfinance as an instrument can help, um, I would start by saying where are some of the challenges where we haven't done such a good job. Well, first, uh, obviously, we have had a low savings rate in this country, about 10 percent, whereas uh, the investment rate has also been around 15 percent, while other regional uh, countries have even reached 30 percent. So that's an area that we need to do well, and I think microfinance can help. At the same time, uh, our tax policies, especially documentation, has been an area we haven't done a good job. Again, microfinance with its outreach, with its capacity to enhance the scope of its activity can help with the documentation of the economy. Uh, also, uh, fiscal deficits in Pakistan have prevented us from really allowing a lot of money to be available to the development sectors because governments have been borrowing a lot of the money from commercial banks and so on. So this combination of microfinance along with tackling the issues of low savings, low investment, problem of financial inclusion and documentation, and above all, it's a good instrument for uh, uplifting the people at the bottom of the pyramid, as they say, and you know, trying to tackle the real problem of uh, poverty. So all this can happen if we preserve uh, a macroeconomic environment that is stable. A good thing about the microfinance sector is that it's a good forum for bringing together a lot of people who play an important part in, in the economy. The government, 
which have to design good policies and implement them and provide a good regulatory framework. The private sector, which obviously has to perform if we are to fulfill our economic goals. The international agencies, which are able to bring good quality experience from the rest of the world as well as uh, financing in some cases. And above all, the communities, because this is an important uh, vehicle for combining the energy of our citizens with our financial sector, with the government and the international uh, best practice knowledge institutions. So I think uh, how do we go about um, achieving a platform of macro stability? So I'll spend maybe you know, three to four minutes talking about where we are in terms of the environment in which these kind of initiatives can uh, have a better chance of success. As you know, this government inherited a pretty grim economic situation. The debts were at their highest level, the fiscal deficits were at their highest level, the current account deficits were at their highest level ever. But I think after 15 months of effort and uh, serious work and collaboration with the international community, we are beginning to see a turnaround and we are beginning to see the economic environment getting more stable more importantly, rec getting recognized as having achieved stability. So what are some of the things that are giving us hope that now things are turning around? First, as you know, we have a program with the International Monetary Fund, and they just concluded the review of our first quarter. And their review stated that all these structural benchmarks agreed with the government were met by comfortable margins. So this was a very uh, strong outside acknowledgement about the government's uh, seriousness and capacity to deliver agreed results. Second, we find now that the private sector of the rest of the world and our own country is beginning to show a lot of confidence in this government, more importantly, in this country and the opportunities it offers. Portfolio investment in our bond market has reached a billion dollars, which has never happened before. So that's a sign that international investors are beginning to think that this is an area which offers tremendous economic opportunity and a transparent way of doing business. Third, if you see the foreign direct investment figures, of this uh, year, compare it this uh, the latest month, they have reached $650 million in one month, which is a 286% increase over the same time last year. So that's another show of confidence. Also, if you see what the rest of the world is saying about us, Bloomberg has just uh, given the figures that in dollar terms, the stock market in Pakistan if you take the last three months, has been the best performing stock market in the entire world. So that is a tremendous uh, articulation of facts. These are facts. These are not partisans. Bloomberg is not a partisan. IMF is not a partisan. And above all, Moody's, which is the global institution whose job it is to uh, rate companies as well as rate governments on their economic situation. They just came day before yesterday and switched Pakistan's rating from negative to stable. So that is again a huge thing and it's not about just the government getting any credit. This Moody's uh, upgrading of Pakistan's rating is a show of confidence and we all as Pakistanis should be happy about it because this is a statement to the rest of the world that this is an area where you should look at seriously because it has reached a level of stability on the economic side. Why are they saying all these things? Because the numbers are speaking for themselves. 
exports, which had been stagnant for the last five years, have achieved a 10%, 9.6% growth rate in this past month alone. Current account deficit, which we inherited at $20 billion, the highest ever, became a surplus for the first time uh, in many years last month. Uh, fiscal uh, deficit adjusted for interest payments, which we call primary balance, was surplus during the first quarter of this year. So the incentives given to the uh, uh, exporters in terms of no taxes on the export sector, subsidization of electricity and gas and even loans because we want to promote exports. And as a result of that, you are beginning to see Pakistan making this transition away from being a largely import-oriented economy to one where the focus is shifting towards exports and earning of dollars so that the people of Pakistan can improve the quality of their life. And I think all these things are combining in a good way to create a stable environment in which initiatives of the sort that you are taking can, uh, can uh, thrive. Now turning to the, uh, to the uh, sector itself. See, the way I see it is there are three or four questions that we need to ask because it's very important we pose the right questions. If we do not pose the right question, we can spend a lot of time maybe coming out with answers to the wrong questions. So this is my humble opinion. I'm sure you are experts know much more than I do. But I see that the first thing is, uh, how do we go about reducing the cost of doing business in this sector? Which means both the interest costs as well as uh, Nadim was saying the processing costs. This is question number one. And we have to come up with a good answer to that. Second is how do we increase access? How do we actually scale up? The third is uh, how do we enhance the impact? And you know, what does impact mean? Uh, in terms of jobs, in terms of uh, tackling poverty in terms of altering the results of the projects. Uh, then, how do we keep learning, both from successes elsewhere and successes within the country, which institutions are doing better, which areas are doing better, which sectors or industries are doing better, which type of borrowers are doing better. Because, as you know, more and more we have to switch from a kind of a we have to switch to evidence-based thinking and continuously learning from experience, both our own as well as others. And then to say, okay, what can we, as the finance minister, I expect that I will be told, what can I do for you? Uh, do we need to design the incentives better? Do we need to you know, do some kind of financial intermediation? Do, are there market imperfections that we can tackle? Are there regulatory uh, excesses that we can curtail? Are there ways in which, you know, the central bank can do a better job or the government can, you know, support these initiatives? What are good optimal ways uh, of you know, promoting this industry in a, in a, in a partnership between uh, the businesses, because it is a commercial business, as well as the government, which is interested in making a success out of it. So I would be looking forward really to uh, getting something at the end of this uh, meeting I want to get, share in the end just a, a few bits of advice since in my lifetime I've had an opportunity to, under, uh, to participate in many of these kind of seminars and conferences. And I want to say that, you know, 
what you should be focusing and what you should avoid, okay? The first is that you have an important topic, okay? It's if you have a conference, it's important to have an important topic. And I think there can't be anything uh, that's important and timely as this is. Second, that you get the relevant stakeholders. And after seeing the list of people who are here, I can say you succeeded in doing that. The third is, of course, to have a nice setting. And I can't think of any setting better than this in the entire country. And I'm sure there are going to be nice lunch breaks and all that. And so, and also to get, you know, uh, high quality speakers, which again, looking at the list, you had and spend ample amount of time, which also it appears you will be. Now, what is it that I think, you know, if I can offer without being disrespectful, suggest? I think you have way too many speakers, okay, and way too little time for actual discussion. I don't know what you can do about it, but you know, it's deadly boring to just sit and have thousands of people give speeches and then you go away. So if uh, there is a way to strike a balance between uh, listening to speeches, I mean, smart people can also be boring speakers. So it's more important to allow a kind of a interaction and you know, pose the questions and try to find the answers. And if the answers are practical enough and have real operational content, then I think we should define success in that way. So in my, in my view, humble view, if you can come out with you know, a few good ideas that are obviously trying to offer solutions to some of our uh, problems, but are also practical, and really can be implemented in this, uh, you know, space or this environment where we are. And if you want the government to assist or participate in any way, you have to tell us in a simple uh, language what exactly it is that we can do. Because otherwise, you know, there's a risk that there will be, you know, uh, a lot of uh, speeches, uh, which are, which are, you know, okay, and one learns a lot. But I think uh, one has to strike a balance between just learning and also doing. So my thought is, as I work more in the government and moved away from an earlier life in which uh, I was, you know, much more interested in learning new ideas, I still am. But I think we should really get to the uh, to, to, to what uh, we can do to alter the lives of the people to make this industry really a success and to fulfill uh, the hopes of our people as well as the participants in this uh, industry. So I'm delighted to be here and uh, appreciate the offer to you know participate in this and wish you all the best. Thank you. That's Minister. I think you hit the nail on the head by asking three very pertinent questions. Nadine covered the first one, and that is something that we'll have a dialogue on in terms of reducing operating costs as well as bringing down interest. And I think that's a, that's a huge question that is going to be addressed this afternoon. You asked two more areas. You talked about increasing the access to, for inclusion. And let me share with you, sir, some statistics. We have 37 MFIs, MFP players in the country. And if I was to look at the comparables in our region, Sri Lanka has 66, Bangladesh has 724, India has 3,000 MFIs who are operating. Now, where is our problem? Our problem is that we have not been able to create more MFIs purely because of no capital. So my suggestion and request to you, sir, is that we need some allocation of grant to initiate initial capital injection for some of these institutions to come up and expand the network, and particularly grants that you can divert to this sector for purposes of where the penetration levels in areas like Baluchistan, KP, and GB are very limited. 
So I would really request you to think of allocating some funds for seed capital for these institutions so that we can expand and create perhaps 100 and 150 more participants so we can become more, uh, you know, entied with your strategy because financial inclusion, poverty elevation are the milestones or the key points of your government and we, sir, are your partners in implementing that strategy. So we need to work more aggressively and more collaboratively to enable us to take it to the next level. So you talked about impact. We did a study with Karan Das, and let me share you some uh, results of that. One million of lending generates 27 jobs in the marketplace, MFIs. And if we can create more opportunity for them to lend, then we can create more job opportunities. Again, a key driver of your strategy. PMIC, sir, uh, was set up with PPF, Karandas, and KFW as an apex institution. We are the only apex institution in the microfinance sector, and we are focused on the um, SDGs, which the government has already signed off on, and our key areas continue to be poverty alleviation and financial inclusion. So, once again, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for being here. Uh, your presence is critical. We are your partners. We want to work with you more effectively and more efficiently. And these people who are sitting here are truly your ambassadors in the financial inclusion program. So I really urge you to think about the fund allocation for creating more MFIs, and I'm happy to have that conversation with you later on. Thank you very much for your presence. Appreciate your being here. State Bank of Pakistan. Uh, may I request Mr. Samar Rathnan, uh, sir? And Samar Saab has done a tremendous job, uh, job in supporting the sector. <laughs> Mr. Shahzeb Ali, may I say, and one of the recommendations of uh, the Maligam Commission report was that the entire industry needs to be regulated. And so SECP came in, stepped in, and they regulated the NGOs into non-bank money also. Finally, sir, from the stakeholder side, sir, Pakistan Microfinance Investment Company. This is the national apex, uh, the lender, and it's also a sort of player which is building the microfinance sector in Pakistan. May I request Mr. Yasir Ashwag, the CEO of PMIC, four minutes of your time. Uh, we now need to recognize the six, seven microfinance providers who have got uh, international and rec uh, 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 national level recognition in the last one year. May I request Ms. Uh, Amina Hassan, Group Head, Business Khushali Microfinance Bank Limited. They got smart certification, which is a very clear certification in terms of their focus on client protection initiatives, and a green office certification, which clearly indicates Khushali's bank's focus on triple bottom line business in microfinance. <laughs> Mr. Amir Khan, President and Board. Thank you very much, sir. 